Welcome to worship for January, Sunday, January 17th, 2021. I'm Pastor Heidi Ranker. Our soloist is Diane Hiddleston, and our organist is Jeff Burke. The service is produced and brought to you by Jackie Hull, our media specialist. <laughs> I'm going to use Psalm 139 as our call to worship. It's one of my favorite psalms, and uh, it's on the lectionary for today. I will be preaching to it as well. O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in, behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my beds in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are the sum of your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I'm awake... I am still with you. And here's a couple verses or a few verses that I would normally not uh, use, but, but uh, I'm going to include them today. If, if only you would slay the wicked, O God, away from me, you bloodthirsty men. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. That's the reason I would normally not include that because in the New Testament we have, we have Jesus saying, don't hate your enemies, love them and pray for them, pray for those who persecute them. Don't, don't go after them with, uh, um, to, to slay them. And then the last two verses. Search me, O God, and know my heart. And test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. May God add a blessing to this reading from the Holy Word. At this point, Diane, I'm going to have Diane sing for us. O oh, worship the King, number 73. <laughs> Yeah. 
prayer is the prayer of St. Francis, found in our hymnal, page 481, uh, from St. Francis of Assisi, uh, Italy, 13th century, a very beautiful and classic prayer. Let us pray. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. At this point, I would like to share with you the gospel lesson taken from John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip... He said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching him, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see far greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Here ends the reading from the Gospel. At this point, I'm going to have Diane sing for us, He Leadeth Me, number 128, 128, all the verses. Oh, boy, I would be for by 
Like stupid. One of the things that bugs me about a lot of TV shows and commercials is that they feature a lot of stupid people doing stupid things. They probably just do that so we can laugh at their silly antics and perhaps even feel superior to them. However, arrogance isn't good either. And the Bible teaches us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that love is not proud or arrogant or rude. Besides, no one wants to be around a person who claims to know it all or acts like they do, because usually they're arrogant jerks if that's the way they act. Except for Jesus. But Jesus wasn't a jerk. He was humble and loving and kind. Still, I think that Jesus knew everything, with the exception of the time when God the Father would have him return to earth. And why do I say that? Because Jesus was fully God, as well as fully human, and God knows everything. The Bible teaches that our God is omniscient, which means he knows everything, which is great because a stupid God wouldn't be worthy of our worship now, would he? Would we want to be laughing at God like we do some of the bungling characters on a TV sitcom? I don't think so. I want a God I can respect a God who knows what I don't know and can help me to have wisdom and understanding too. That's the kind of God our God is, the, God, the kind of God the Bible describes. Tony Evans, in his book, Our God is Awesome, gives a really good and easy to understand definition of God's omniscience or all-knowingness. He wrote, and I quote, a simple definition is that God's omniscience refers to his perfect knowledge of all things, both actual and potential. The omniscience of God means that there is absolutely nothing God doesn't know, that no informational system or set of data exists anywhere outside of God's knowledge. Nothing. He depends on no one outside himself for any knowledge about anything. Evans also adds, God does not gain knowledge by learning. He does not need to study, read, or analyze. He knows what he knows simply because he knows it. He did not learn it. Friends, that last point about God not having to learn anything from anyone is highlighted by the prophet Isaiah's words found in chapter 40, verse 13 and 14. There the prophet asks rhetorically, who has understood the mind of the Lord or instructed him as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him and who taught him the right way? 
Who was it that taught him knowledge is, and, or showed him the path of understanding? The answer that is implied in the text, but not supplied, is this. Nobody. Nobody teaches God. In fact, Isaiah continued a few verses later to say in verse 17 and 18, Before him all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. To whom then will you compare God? So while we are getting so worked up about American politics and our nation, the Bible teaches that in the grand scheme of things from God's perspective, nations are insignificant. And we should not believe that God has granted our nation his most favored nation status, for that went long time ago to ancient Israel. And look how that turned out. God has punished his chosen people repeatedly when they went astray from his word and his ways and broke his covenant with them, just like God will punish any nation or person who does the same and does not repent of our sins, whether national or personal, corporate or individual. And the fact is that God is omniscient means that, God's know, that God knows what all those sins we or our nation have committed are, even when we may not. He knows all the racism and xenophobia we harbor in our hearts, the prejudices and privileges that we sin sinfully cling to. God knows our violence and immorality as a nation and as individuals and doesn't need the FBI or the police to track us down or anyone else to turn us in. Psalm 139 teaches us that God knows when we sit down and when we rise up. He doesn't need an Apple Watch to keep track of that information or a Fitbit. Indeed, the psalmist wrote of God, you discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. That means that God knows everywhere you sleep, and everyone you sleep with, and much more besides. So that means, for instance, that you may think you may be deceiving your husband or your wife, but God knows when you're breaking your marriage vows and committing adultery, whether it's emotional adultery or physical. After all, the psalmist also wrote in verse 11 and 12, if I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Folks, the bottom line is that we can't hide any of our sins of any kind from God because in his divine omniscience, he sees them and knows them all. In fact, Psalm 139 also teaches us that God not only knows all our actions, he knows our unspoken thoughts. Verse 2 stated, you perceive my thoughts from afar. And verse 4 said, before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. Obviously, there is no way that we as human beings can come anywhere near having that kind of intimate knowledge of our own selves, let alone of all the creation that God has made, because he has indeed made us and all the universe. God's knowledge is awesome and incredible and wonderful and absolutely incomparable. Psalm 139 also teaches the doctrine of God's omnipresence, meaning that God is everywhere, which goes neatly along with God knowing everything. Anyway, the doctrine of God's omniscience should give us pause if we are trying to hide any wrongdoing from God, but it can also give us comfort in, in that the fact that God knows us so well and yet loves us nevertheless. The fact that God knows even our thoughts also means that God understands us completely and therefore can judge us with compassion and mercy as well as with absolute fairness. Sometimes people misunderstand us, but God never will. The author of Psalm 139, who may have been King David about 3,000 years ago, asked God to use his knowledge of 
his own heart and soul to help him. David wrote, and I quote, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. What a wonderful prayer. We should all be asking for God's help to lead us in his ways, which lead us to life everlasting. And we would do well to follow the psalmist's example and ask God not only to know our anxious thoughts, but also to help us to better deal with them, especially in this time of pandemic and national tensions and financial distress for so many. It should be that understanding that our good God knows everything we are going through and always has our best interests at heart, that knowing that can help to calm some of our anxieties, even in these difficult times. Our omniscient, all-knowing God is a God that we can trust and depend on. Can you imagine, in contrast, having a clueless God who didn't even know your name? But our God knows even how many hairs are on each one of our heads. Jesus said, as recorded in Matthew chapter 10, verse 29 and 30, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Now, I bet there are some of us listening to this wishing that God would keep more of those hairs on our head, but it seems that God is in control of how many hairs there are, and there is only so much that we can do to try and keep them on our heads and out of our ears and our noses as we age. Much more importantly, according to Psalm 139, God knows in advance the day of our birth and the day of our death. Verse 16 reads, and I quote, All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. And I believe the reference there is to God's book of life. God's knowledge is beyond our understanding, his thoughts so far above our limited knowledge. Tony Evans describes God's knowledge of time well, in my opinion. He explains, and I quote him once again, Because God is an eternal being, whatever he knows, he knows immediately and simultaneously. Because he is eternal, God does not have to look back to the past to remember or to look forward to the future to project. All knowledge, past, present, and future, resides in him, in the eternal now. All that is known, has been known, will be known, could be known, or has been forgotten, God knows intuitively and eternally. End quote. Isn't that amazing? We really can't even comprehend having that kind of knowledge, but I absolutely believe that God possesses it because that's what the Bible teaches about our God. Further, as I stated earlier, I believe that Jesus as God's Son, fully human yet fully God, possessed that same divine knowledge and omniscience. And we see that divine knowledge demonstrated in our gospel lesson for today from John chapter 1. There in that account, Jesus knew Nathanael's character before he even met him. Recall that verse 47 said, When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching him, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. Now Nathanael was shocked and asked, How do you know me? Indicating by his response that he agreed with Jesus' assessment, yet was astounded by Jesus' knowledge of him, of his own lack of deceit and his straightforwardness. Wouldn't it be nice if Jesus could say that about all of us? Anyway, Jesus responded, responded somewhat cryptically by saying, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. 
Now, friends, Nathanael could not have been in Jesus' line of physical sight, even from a distance, or Nathanael would never have responded by emphatically declaring, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. You see, I think it's clear that Jesus saw Nathanael without seeing him with, with his physical human eyes, and he knew Nathanael before even meeting him for the first time because Jesus was God in the flesh and God sees everything and knows everyone to the very depth of their being, even before they take a breath on this earth. Jesus displayed that same kind of divine supernatural knowledge of people when he met the anonymous Samaritan woman at the well, an encounter which the Bible describes in John chapter 4. Again, he'd never met the woman before, yet he knew that she had had five husbands and was living with a sixth man when he met her. And he didn't have to ask all the town gossips for that inf- in order to get that information, in order to know it. Furthermore, in John chapter 5, Jesus claimed spiritual knowledge of some Jews who were persecuting him. Not, that not only included the current state of their hearts, but also an and an accurate knowledge of their future potential actions. Certain knowledge only God could know. To them, Jesus declared, I do not accept praise from people, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. Even today, Jesus knows whether we are inclined to accept his words or that of false prophets and and false messiahs or people that claim to be doing his will and are not. In addition, like God the Father had foreknowledge of the times of people's births and death, Jesus also had divine foreknowledge of his friend Lazarus's death in John chapter 11, and of the fact that he would raise Lazarus from the dead. And of course, if you, you, you probably know that Jesus predicted his own death and resurrection on several occasions and was well, of its, well aware of its proper timing in God's plan. Friends, Jesus was the Son of God and the King of Israel, as Nathaniel's exclaimed, as Nathaniel exclaimed that he was, and as the Son of God and Israel's Messiah and King, Jesus died on the cross as the perfect sacrifice to pay the penalty for all humanity's sin and wrongdoing, including our own. Therefore, let us confess our sins, which he and God the Father know anyway, and turn away from those sins and place our faith and trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, so that we might be saved if we have not already done so. For there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved, and it is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ that we can be saved from eternal punishment. Recall that when Jesus walked this earth, he promised Nathanael that he would see the heaven open and the angels of God descending and ascending on the Son of Man, by which he met himself. While the Bible does not have a record of Nathaniel recording that vision, if his other name was Bartholomew, as some scholars believe that it was, he became one of Jesus' twelve devoted disciples and saw many miracles performed by Jesus in order to prove who he was to us. And my friends, if we want to see heaven's gates open to us and the angels of God celebrate our salvation, let us worship our omniscient God and worship his son, Jesus Christ, as the son of God, co-equal with God and the Holy Spirit, all knowing like God and the Holy Spirit, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. At this point, I would like to have uh, Diane sing for us, I am thine, O Lord. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice and it told thy love to me. Where thou hast died, draw me nearer, 
Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spent, when I kneel in prayer and with thee. My God, I commune as friend with friend. Draw me nearer and nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer and nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding there are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I Let us be in prayer. Lord God, I pray that this week will be a peaceful one in this country and that we will have a peaceful transition of power to President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. I pray that those who, have, who mistakenly believe that Trump won the election will come to know and accept the tr that, that truth that he lost quickly and to reject other lies and conspiracy theories. Lord God, in your mercy, preserve and protect our democracy and protect our citizens and all our elected officials from violence. Help those who hold office to tell the truth and to guide them by your wisdom in the paths of peace and righteousness and justice. May those who have committed crimes be held accountable for them and may you protect and assist our police and military and other law enforcement agencies in the performance of their lawful duties and protect them from abusing their powers in any way in this difficult time. During this pandemic, we pray, O oh Lord, for the healing of all those who are sick or injured, whether from COVID or other illnesses. We lift up Jerry, Judy, Julie, David, and many others, including those ways in which we might need healing for ourselves. We pray for physical healing for those who are ill in body, and emotional and spiritual healing for those who are mentally ill or spiritually troubled. And for those who are suffering from addictions, we pray that you might free them from their bondages to substances and behaviors that are less than life-giving. We pray also that you would bless and help all caregivers as well, Lord, including all our health care workers, emergency personnel, and others. Guide, we pray, the safe and speedy and equitable distribution of the vaccine, not only here in the United States, but abroad as well. Help the mass production of those vaccines and other medicines and supplies to meet global demand. And Lord, it would, of course, be wonderful if you would just stop in step in and stop this pandemic in its track. 
tasks by a miracle. Bless your church, universal, in this time, in this age. And gracious God, we pray that you would comfort those who are grieving and lift up all those who are anxious and depressed. Calm those who are angry and frustrated and give us all your grace. Be with all those who are hungry and homeless, who are struggling financially and in their relationships, for all those who are in desperate state, straits because of so many things and circumstances. And in your mercy, Lord, help more people to come to a saving faith and knowledge of your, Lord, of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. And will you please join me now in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now may God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, bless, preserve, comfort, and keep you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord and spread his message of love and peace and joy. Amen.